Hello and welcome to today's demonstration. The exciting part about my work as an MR physicist is to improve MR imaging. MR systems are instruments to perform imaging of the inside of the body. They themselves, however, are in many aspects black boxes. When I create novel MR sequences, it is often difficult to know how faithfully the system is performing them. System hardware limitations can create small differences between what my code instructs the scanner to do and what the scanner actually executes. Often image quality is affected by these discrepancies and I need to resort to less optimal sequences. There are many sources of system field fluctuations, including eddy currents and thermal drifts. Field fluctuations span timescales of microseconds to minutes. The accuracy and precision of the gradient evolution play a key role in determining image quality and geometric consistency, as well as the reproducibility and accuracy of derived quantitative results. Not accounting for these perturbations often degrades the value of the images for neuroscientists and clinical researchers. To understand and overcome these limitations, I need a tool which acts like an oscilloscope, a tool many engineers use every day to report on the actual performance of the system. Scope tools, including the dynamic field camera, use an array of NMR field probes to report on system performance, very much like an oscilloscope. Let's start at the beginning, positioning the camera in the bore and calibration. The scope dynamic field camera is placed on the patient bed on the scanner. Scope offers positioning tools to enable accurate and reproducible placement of the camera on multiple scanner beds. Once the dynamic field camera is positioned, it is driven to the scanner's isocenter and we can begin configuration of the calibration protocol on both scanner and acquisition system. Scope field cameras must first be calibrated to establish the locations of the individual field probes in gradient space before the camera can be used to monitor field dynamics. We use four acquisitions to calibrate the position and static off-frequency resonance of each field probe. The first repetition is acquired without any activity of the scanner and measures the local field at that position. Then we play three acquisitions, each with a 2.5 millitesla per meter gradient on one of each of the three physical axes. From the acquisition system side, calibration is started by launching Scope FX, the software responsible for operating the acquisition system and interpreting the results. By pressing calibrate, the calibration window pops up. Here we choose to do a new calibration, which then allows us to set the parameters to match our specific calibration sequence. We then press start scan and wait until the system is ready. Once the LED light appears, we can scan the calibration sequence on the MR scanner. Notice the progress bar incrementing with each TR. After four acquisitions, we see the scope system post-processing the data and showing an analysis of data quality. We can see the average and boundary FIDs on the left with indications for probe SNR and lifetime on the right. Clicking to the next screen, we see a point cloud of the positions of the probe as measured by the calibration scan. Here we can verify that they are positioned about isocenter, and if not, we can reposition the camera and start again. Next, we select what order of the spherical harmonic we wish to use as a basis set. The choice of an appropriate basis set will be based on the number of probes available for the higher order case-based trajectory calculations and the imaging application. Having chosen this, the dynamic field camera is now calibrated and we can progress to acquire data which can be applied to image reconstruction. To start our investigation of field dynamics, we will first acquire a simple triangular blip on each axis with several seconds between each TR to allow the long-term eddy currents to decay. These blips are defined in a scanner vendor-specific pulse sequence. This simple pulse sequence will allow us to demonstrate many of the features of the acquisition system before moving to more complex pulse sequences, including spiral and diffusion sequences. Setting up a pulse sequence for monitoring by the dynamic field camera 
requires minor modifications to include triggers at the beginning of the readout positions. The scanner sends a TTL trigger to the scope acquisition system with each TR. This begins the readout. In this sequence, we are monitoring three blips. Each blip is played out only once, meaning we have three dynamics or TRs to capture. On the acquisition system, we set the number of dynamics to three. We want to measure long enough after each triangular blip to see the system response, so we set the acquisition duration in this instance to 20 milliseconds. After starting the scan on the scope system, we wait for the LED ready light, then proceed to scan. As the triggers are played out, we can see the scope system acquiring data. Data is automatically processed on the acquisition system after the scan is completed. Here we can now inspect the gradient and case space waveforms on ScopeFX. The effect of eddy currents and gradient vibrations can be seen. Note that as we step through the three dynamics of the scan, viewing the case space traversal, each axis has a different response. For example, each gradient blip couples strongly to the B0K component. Switching to viewing the gradient directly, we see how blips such as these can form the basis for a characterization of the gradient impulse response function. The complete method for calculating a gradient impulse response function is outlined in a paper by Johanna Vagnesio in MRM 2016. Such measurements with the dynamic field camera allow for direct, fast and accurate characterization of gradient and shim systems, such as frequency responses and higher order field dynamics. Next, let's acquire a real imaging sequence. We will acquire a single shot spiral image at 220 by 220 matrix size. This spiral utilizes the full capacity of the gradient slew rate the distortions from this single shot spiral are greater than multi shot spirals, which do not require gradients to slew as quickly. As before, we adjust the scope acquisition parameters to capture the waveform. We know the spiral shot is 59 milliseconds long, with only one shot required for a full image. Here we can set the acquisition duration to capture the whole waveform. First, we'll try an axial spiral with gradient activity primarily in the two transverse planes. We capture the full acquisition duration starting from the slice select gradient pre-winder. Having acquired the spiral, we can see the measured case space trajectory in the upper plot and the gradient waveform in the lower plot. If we zoom in, we can see unexpected effects in the Z gradient axis and the dynamic B0 term. Further, we can examine higher order field components. Let's take a look at the phase accrual of the Z squared concomitant field term. Notice that the term increases with the length of the spiral, meaning that this term will have detrimental impacts on high resolution spiral imaging. Concomitant gradients are the spatially non-linear gradients which occur as a result of Maxwell's laws. ScopeFX measurements also include the concomitant fields. Shown is an example in which another imaging dataset was reconstructed correcting for concomitant fields, then reconstructed again without that correction. Note the distortion that these fields cause in the image. Let's quickly look at an oblique spiral acquired at an angle to the transverse plane. Now as we look at the concomitant fields, we can see the evolution of additional terms as compared to the non-oblique measurement. Using the data from the scope field camera, we obtain directly measured higher order terms instead of only numerical approximations. Especially for quantitative MRI and non-Cartesian imaging, it's important to account for these. By incorporating the measured trajectory into image reconstruction software, image quality and robustness can be substantially improved, 
which enables new MR applications. Now let's return to scanning and add a diffusion preparation to our spiral sequence. Spiral diffusion imaging is particularly interesting since diffusion applications are very often limited by low SNR and low spatial resolution. By choosing a spiral readout instead of EPI, we can shorten the echo time and thereby significantly increase image signal. Let's try three diffusion directions at B equals 1000 plus a B equals 0 image. We set everything up as before, ensuring we capture the entire readout train. Hitting scan as before, we see data being processed by ScopeFX. We again see the case space and gradient webforms. The diffusion preparation requires large gradients, which result in long-lived eddy currents. If we zoom in, we can see the difference in the encoding between the non-diffusion weighted B equals zero acquisitions and the subsequent diffusion weighted acquisition. By visualizing the difference among these acquisitions, we can directly see the effect of the diffusion preparations. Interestingly, the eddy current responses are not only of the zeroth and the first order, but also have significant higher order contributions which change for each diffusion direction. In diffusion imaging, with an EPI readout, the related distortions cause geometrical inconsistency among images with different diffusion encoding, as can be seen in this demonstration. These distortions can be corrected by accounting for the changes in the encoding. In spiral imaging, the undesirable field terms result in blurred images. Here you can see the impact of using different measured field terms for reconstruction. Without any treatment of these undesirable field terms during reconstruction, the phantom is strongly blurred. First order correction reduces the blurring significantly. The blurring can be fully removed when also accounting for higher order fields. Taking into account the measured higher order case based trajectory allows arriving at high quality in vivo images. Having demonstrated some benefits of using field dynamics, let's next discuss how these measurements can be done quickly and easily. The calibration and measurement process can also be automated, whereby the scanner can control the scope acquisition system, thereby reducing the effort needed to capture the necessary data in cases where the parameters for a scan have become well established and are repeatedly used. We enable the remote acquisition interface and start a scope-aware exam card. We can see the scope system is now under the scanner's control. The values for a DWI spiral scan are populating in the acquisition system. Now we start the scan and you can see the scope system ready itself and start acquiring. In this way, we can make the process of measuring field dynamics even easier. In addition to monitoring system dynamics, we can investigate the influence of external fields on the scanner's field. We can set up the scope system to continuously sample the magnetic field without a sequence running. Let's start the acquisition in a free running mode and demonstrate how you can see the field fluctuate in response to a variety of sources. Before I enter the scanner room, we can see an oscillating behaviour of the measured magnetic fields. This is probably an effect from the cryopump. As I approach the scanner, we can see the field fluctuate as the body couples into the field, and we can watch fields fluctuate to a greater degree as I stick my head and my hand in the bore.
There are many sites worldwide that are sited near to parking, roads or train tracks. Cars and trains can greatly distort the magnetic field, often at inopportune times. We demonstrate the effect of a car parking in the space directly outside the scan suite. First, we back the car up to the side of the scan suite and sure enough, there is the first field response. The second field response lobe is from the car parking frontways into the spot. I hope this was an instructive introduction to the capabilities of the dynamic field camera. While the dynamic field camera is the instrument for people who do MR engineering and MR methods development, Scope offers a variety of other solutions to suit any MR scientist. The clip-on camera is an instrument for scientifically minded MR researchers who would like to explore the field dynamics of their system and experimental setup with the most flexibility. The NeuroCam and Scope Eye, in turn, are providing image detail and consistent image datasets to people who request best available MR imaging performance for their research. I hope you enjoyed this demonstration. Feel free to reach out if you have questions at any time.